I, I, we're not going to put the words up, but I'm going to give you the words. You ready? Behold, he comes. Y'all got it? So I want you all to sing, Behold, he comes. But you got to hold it. You got to hold it. Because this section here is going to come right behind you, and you all are going to sing, Behold, he comes. And you're going to hold it. So you all are going to be holding it. You got to get big breath. And then this side over here is going to sing, Behold, he comes. And you're going to hold it. And then the choir is going to join in and sing, Behold, he comes. You ready? Everybody stand up. Everybody stand. We're going to start right over here on this section. You ready? You got to sing. I want to hear you. Here it is. Behold, he comes. Behold, he comes. Behold, he comes. Behold, he comes. And every eye shall see him. And It is great to have the founder of Tabernacle Baptist Church, my brother, Dr. Bob Ware. Tom, where's the first time you heard that, Behold, He Comes? Highland Park Baptist. I was there many times and heard it. I'm supposed to welcome you, and you are welcome, you know that. And I'm the guest. Uh, thank you for coming. And let me be a part. Now let's bow together and pray. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, and that's the only way we can come. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. We're sinners, but we love you. We pray your good blessings on the services today, the speakers. Lord, thank you for what Dr. Tom gave us. I'll never forget that. Bless the preachers as they preach. Good, spirit-filled, Bible-believing preachers. Bless them. And Lord, help us to enjoy and grow spiritually. Thank you for the church and what, what you've done here and are doing here. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Before you're seated, I'm ready for Jesus to come. Amen. And you know why? Thank you. See, I'm saved. Amen. Amen. That's good. I'm saved. 500 in your hymnals. 500. Open them up. Let's sing that we're saved, saved, saved. 500. I found a
must conform, or we will be left by the change. New world religion serves a God of their choice, the salvation still comes in one day. Seven hundred, seventy-two, seven hundred, seventy-two. Let's all stand up when we all get to heaven. Seven hundred, seventy-two. Sing with me. Sing now, wonders.
Shake somebody's hand, say good morning. with me when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all sing Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory when we all get to heaven sing it when we all Thank you. You may be seated. God bless you. That's wonderful. Brother Patterson, come on up to the platform. Starting tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, I want to invite all of you back for the International Fellowship Fundamental Baptist meeting. And uh, it'll be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night at 7. Tomorrow night, we got Brother Fred Adams is going to be with us, and he and his deaf folk. And uh, he is a deaf uh, pastor, preacher. He has a Bible college. And they're going to be singing for us. What? Exactly. You will miss a treat if you miss that, I promise you. And Brother Tim Schelling, I couldn't remember Brother Schelling's last name on Wednesday night. I had, a, I had just a, ma'am, senior moment, my wife said. And so I have to stop and give attention whenever she speaks. Because when she speaks, Pastor Steve listens. And... Uh, then Tuesday morning, we start on Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning at 9.30. And if you'd like to come in, you please come if you can. Uh, I promise you, you'll enjoy Brother Glenn Riggs and Brother Johnny Daniels and Brother uh, Mike Setzer. And uh, then Tuesday night, Brother Don Strange will be here with us. He's already called me today saying, I'm praying for the meeting. I pray you all have a great day today. And uh, Brother Garvin Walls will be here on Tuesday night. And, Wednesday morning, we're going to put some young guys on the platform. Brother Marcus is going to preach for us. And uh, oh, don't applaud. I get no respect. And uh, but Brother uh, Anthony Aiken is going to be speaking for us on uh, Wednesday morning as well. We'll have just great meetings, great meetings, Brother uh, Melvin Aiken to close everything out on Wednesday night. Choir's going to be singing, and I'm happy about that with some great singing. I promise you, you'll enjoy yourself. But that's tomorrow. I'm looking forward to blessing the day. My cup's running over right now, so I think probably you just sort of pray there, Brother Knickerbocker, and 
and let's go eat. <clears throat> Ushers, come with our offering trays. Give us an opportunity to take part in our tithes and in our offerings. Again, I appreciate your faithfulness, Tabernacle Baptist Church. I appreciate what, what you do each and every week in your tithes and offerings, and I'm thankful that God has blessed us the way that he has. Brother Mike Patterson is a part of the International Fellowship of Fundamental Baptist, and this is about the only meeting that he's able to attend because of his schedule, traveling all over the United States, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a friend, and I love, uh, I love Jenny, and I'm thankful for the Pattersons, but I really love Jenny. And uh, <laughs> Brother Mike... <laughs> Brother Mike, it's great to have you all with us once again. Why don't you pray and ask God's blessing? You're not brother. preaching this week? <laughs> no. Oh. Just Yay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you, dear God, for the privilege we have to gather here. Lord, this morning, and Father, just uh, for this church here in Orlando, God, for the lighthouse that it has been. And God, I thank you for Pastor Father. I thank you for Brother Knickerbocker this morning. Father, help him, Lord. Fill him with your spirit, dear God. Give him the message for the hour. Now, Father, for this offering, we pray as it's taken up that the funds will be used to your honor and to your glory. Help us not to withhold and hold back, God, but help us to give according to what you'd have us to do. Amen. We'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Three hundred thirty-eight. Three hundred thirty-eight. Let's all stand up. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Three hundred thirty-eight.
may be seated. I always look forward to hosting the IFFB because I get to fellowship a little bit with some very special people and, uh, and it's always, always, always an honor to have preachers and missionaries and evangelists uh, in our midst. And uh, this week we'll have, uh, oh I don't know, we'll have probably a dozen, 14 preachers. And uh, I'm just looking forward to it. Tonight, Brother David Price will be with us. And I appreciate Dr. Price. And so you'll want to be back at 6 o'clock tonight. Dr. Dan Knickerbocker. Everybody said I kept saying Tom on Wednesday night, but his name is Dan. He and I met some years ago. He was president of the IFFB, and he called me, and he said, Steve, he said, we need some young people in the IFFB. <laughs> Made me feel good. <laughs> so it's because of him wanting young people involved in the IFFB that I made a commitment to that. And so thank you, Dan. And uh, so he and I are young guys, I guess. He's been a professor, he's been a pastor, he's evangelist, mission work all over the world. And I'm thankful for him. So he's going to come and preach for us. I want you to give your undivided attention to the reading and the preaching of the Word of God. But before he comes, I've asked the trio if they'd sing for us this morning. <clears throat> parents couldn't find him but the scribes and the pharisees were all gathered round him as a boy in the temple speaking with such wisdom and they were all amazed at what he said and in the middle of it all there was jesus us. The one crying in the wilderness 
wilderness, John the baptizer spoke of one who was to come baptizing with fire. When John baptized him, the heavens were opened, and God descended like a dove. And in the middle of it all, there was Jesus. The wedding at Cana, the wine from water going to the ruler's house to bring life to his daughter he spoke with authority straight from the father no one could explain away his power and in the middle of it all there was Jesus outside of town a man hung there bleeding dying for the souls of men to captives bring freedom three, three days, days later his tomb was empty he conquered death and the grave Shall we stand together and turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans chapter 1. The Bible tells us there in verse 16. Paul said, I am, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus the one for sinners slain. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I am chiefest. Oh God, speak to us this morning by the power of your Spirit. Regenerate the lost. Encouraged the saved, and fill us with the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Four times in the Bible, the phrase, the just shall live by faith. 
There are three groups of people I would like to speak to this morning. I'm sure that every one of you are in one of these three categories. Number one, the lost that have been saved. Can I get an amen right there? Do you remember when you got saved? I'll never forget. At six years old, I went forward to get saved. An evangelist came to our church, Dr. Throgmorton, preached a hot message on hell and scared me to death. As soon as the invitation was given, I came to the altar to be saved. I was ready. I was a preacher's kid. I'd heard so many messages about Jesus and how to be saved. And at that moment, I was ready to be saved. But nobody dealt with me. Nobody said, Daniel, why did you come? If they had, I would have said, I want to get saved. But I went back to my seat thinking that because I'd gone forward, I was saved. But you know what? I was lost. I deceived myself. At age 14, my father said to me one day, Daniel, I have never seen any indication that you're really saved. And the moment he said that, the power of the Holy Spirit convicted me like he did when I was six. When my dad left to go to work, do the work that God had called him to do. I went and got my Bible at age 14 and I led myself to Christ. (laughs) Oh, was I excited. Dad came home that night and I said, Dad, guess what I did today? I think he was still peeved at me because he said, what, son? Like I'd done something else that was bad. I said, I got saved. He said, we'll see. (laughs) Best thing he could have said. Best thing he could have said was, we'll see if you are truly saved. You see, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Then he convinces us that we need to be saved. He did that when I was six. But when I turned 14, he once again not only convicted me, but he convinced me that I needed to be saved. And at that moment, he converted me. He saved me. He changed me. And I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Oh, was I excited. I had an interest in spiritual things then. It was wonderful. The Bible makes it clear that Christ once put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He also said once to die after this the judgment. Once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says he once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, In the spirit. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ? The just shall live by faith, not by works. No man is saved by his works. Works aren't good enough. Now if you are saved... Are you happy about it? I can't believe how many quote-unquote Christians I've met that said they were saved, but when you looked at them, uh uh-uh. 
When you watch their life, you don't see any evidences of Christ in their life. You see, not only does the Holy Spirit convict us of our sin and convince us our need of a Savior and then convert us, but then He begins to confirm in our lives that we are truly saved. Then he goes a step further, and then he conforms us to the image of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's wonderful to see people's lives change by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon their souls. And then, of course, he comforts us too. That's one of the fringe benefits of being saved, is he comforts us and guides us through our Christian life. That's the first group. Those that were lost but have been saved by the mighty power of God. The second group I want to talk to you about are the lost that are still lost. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to get there before I begin reading Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to draw your attention to verse 38. Now the just shall live by what? Faith. But if any man draw back, my soul hath no pleasure. In him. That's interesting. There are many religious people that are not saved. Nicodemus was one of them. Every once in a while, a preacher gets saved. (laughs) You ever hear about that? One time, a pastor's wife got saved. Yeah. It's amazing how people are religious, but they're lost. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They're never ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I want to tell you something else about them. They're lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. Yes. Religious people need to be saved. They're self-righteous. You ever meet a self-righteous, lost person that thinks they're saved I don't like to be around people like that they're self-righteous in fact the words they're drawn back or draw back what it, what it means is they, they have come right up to the threshold of getting saved and yet they have backed off what would people think You know, people that are more concerned about what people think won't get saved. Yet they can sing the hymns, they can go to church, they can even read their Bible, but they're lost. They draw back. I was reading the biography of Dr. George W. Truitt, the great pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. He was a young man, 18 years old. His mother was a praying mother. His father was lost. But as they went to church, his brothers got saved. But he always drew back. He would not make a commitment for Christ and truly be born again. He sang in church. He was involved in the youth group. He knew all the stories about God, but he was lost. He was in church. This is an amazing story. He, uh, they were in church, was in revival meetings. Two-week revival meeting. The last night, the preacher said, the evangelist said, I must leave. I have another engagement in another city and I must leave. So the pastor was planning on preaching that Sunday morning and in walks the evangelist. And everybody was like, what's he doing here? He said, God told me to come back and preach for another week. The preacher said, hey man, 
The evangelist got up and he preached this verse. Let's read it again, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. George W. Truett sat there in that service and he said, I've been drawing back. And that evangelist preached about saying no to salvation. Religious but lost. And he said that verse of scripture brought me to the altar and brought me into the Lord's family. I think that's beautiful. There are people in churches that have been preaching the gospel for years. They know all about the gospel, but they're lost. They're living a double life. They profess that they know Christ, but their life does not reveal that Christ is there at all. And they need to be saved. I was preaching up in Maine. I shared my testimony as I just did. At the end of the service, a lady came up to me and she said, Brother Knickerbocker, be sure you give your testimony on how you got saved because that's exactly what happened to me. She said, I was sitting in church one Sunday morning. She said, I was absolutely wrapped up in that church. I loved my pastor and his wife. I, I organized the Sunday school. I organized VBS. I took the kids to camp. I was absolutely involved in the work of God. There wasn't anybody in the church more involved than I was. I was sitting in the service. My pastor was preaching. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're lost. Go forward and be saved in the invitation. It almost took her by surprise. She found herself at the altar. And as soon as the pastor saw that she was there, the pastor and his wife came and got down there with her to wonder why would she be coming forward. And they said, what's wrong? Can we pray with you about anything? And she said, Pastor, I'm lost and I've come to be saved. The pastor was shocked. And the pastor said to her, what? You're not, sa you're not saved? She said, no. He goes, you've been doing all these wonderful things for the Lord. She said, Pastor, I've been doing those things for you. I want to be saved. She'd been drawing back all those years because she was living to please people. But this time she came to be born of the Spirit of God. The just shall live by faith. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. We did not save ourselves. The third group. The third group are the saved Spirit-filled. There's no doubt in my mind that some of you know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You know what it means to walk with God and have God's power upon your life. Take your Bibles. Would you go with me to the book of Habakkuk? Habakkuk chapter 2. We find this phrase again. The just shall live by faith. But I want you to notice there's a little bit of a difference here in verse 4. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by what? His faith. Oh. Oh, his faith. The Spirit-filled life is a life where you exercise faith in your life. Where you trust God for spiritual victory. It's where you find God to be all-sufficient. 
And you become to the place where you realize it's not about me doing anything. It's about God doing something through me. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know that our salvation is not of ourself. It's something that's a gift from God. It's a gift. It's not earned. I was preaching up in Alaska. We were staying with my lost brother-in-law. He's made a profession, but he's not living for the Lord at all. But he did tell the Jewish man that lived in the cottage of ways off that uh, my brother-in-law is a fundamental Baptist preacher. Now that'll scare you right there. And so he came over for lunch one afternoon and he said to me, I'm not kidding. We sat down to eat and he, as soon as the prayer was prayed, he said, your brother-in-law told me about you. He's a Jewish man, graduated from Columbia University, Yale University, has all kinds of degrees, a brilliant man. He said, I want you to answer a question for me. He said, I'm Jewish. Do you believe that if Jewish people do not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, we'll go to hell? I said, you said it. You're absolutely right. Boy, he did not like that. He asked me a couple other questions that I don't have time to get into, but for about three hours we talked. I said, you will only be saved by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Heaven is very exclusive. It's only for those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Not all religions lead to God. Many religions lead to damnation. It's faith in Jesus Christ. So it's not our works that saves us. So my wife handed me three gospel tracts to give to this Jewish man before he left. My wife gave her testimony on how she was saved. I gave my testimony on how, how I was saved. And he left there with those tracts and he went back up to his cabin. The next day he came back and I went, oh man, I'm going to get it. He's going to rail on me. He walked in, he looked at me, folded his arms like this, and he said, I want to tell you something, Rev. You are doing a great work. I was shocked. I said to him, did you know you just complimented me? He goes, I know I did. Later in our talking that week, he said to me, I met a reverend a number of years ago here in Alaska that told me that salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. I told him, I said, you're going to get saved. Yeah. And I'm waiting to hear of his salvation. Maybe right now he's drawing back as lost people do. But I believe one day he's going to come to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now what does God need in this hour? He needs people that are filled with the power of the Spirit of God to live in such a way that people would want what Jesus has to offer. You say, well, if I get saved, I'll get persecuted. Well, you'll be lining right up with Jesus. You say some people won't like it. Well, they didn't like Jesus. They crucified him and put him on a tree. And he suffered and bled and died for our salvation. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But oh, to be one of his children. To know that all of my past sins, present sins, and future sins can be forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll take it. That's what we need to see in this day and age in which we live. 
Three types of people. Those that are lost that get saved. You could do that this morning. Yeah. Has the Holy Spirit been drawing you? And you're drawing back? Not now. When it's a more convenient season, I'll get saved. Oh, no. No. Don't ever, don't ever rebel against the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God for your soul's salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Come and receive Jesus Christ. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you a home in heaven. And He'll give you power to live the Christian life. Let's bow together in prayer. For you that are saved, you say, Brother Knickerbocker, I don't feel as though I'm filled with the Spirit. My faith sometimes is very weak and shallow. Then I would encourage you as a Christian to come and say, Lord, with all the power that you have and with all the ability you've given, help me to live a Spirit-filled life. Some of you need to quit some sinning you're doing. Some of you need to make some amends. Go to some people and ask for forgiveness and get your heart absolutely right with God so that you can be filled with the Spirit. I'd like us to stand with heads bowed. Instead of singing invitation, I'd like the pianist just to softly play. But if you're one that's been drawing back and you've never truly been born again by the power of the Spirit of God, I ask you to come right now. There are people here that can take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Would you come? If you've been drawing back, you know you need to be saved. and It's it's been evident through the preaching of the Word of God this morning that you're not saved. You're not 100% sure. Come and get 100% sure. Would you come right now? Christians? Would you come? Maybe God's been trying to get you to do some things that you won't do. You've been drawing back in relation to service. Maybe drawing back in relation to spiritual victory. Why don't you come as a Christian and say, Oh God, I'm tired of fooling with sin and I need your power upon my life. I want the filling of the power of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. Would you come? This is the opportunity for God to have His way in your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The song says Jesus paid it all. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we truly can sing all to Him I owe. If you're saved this morning, my question is, where are you with the Lord? Peter followed afar off. Are you walking with him? Fellowshipping with him? If you don't know the Lord as personal Savior, you need to get saved this morning. You need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. If you've been saved, not been baptized, I believe you ought to be a member of a Bible-believing church and serve the Lord. Someone else? With our heads bowed, eyes closed, could we just kind of breathe the words of that in prayer and in praise to our Lord? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. Crimson stain. Thanks be unto God. He washed it white as snow. One more time, sing it. Jesus paid it all. Sin had left crimson stain. He was 
My Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day, and I'm thankful, Lord, that there is faith to sustain us. Lord, I ask you that you would help us, that we would take that which we have heard today, and Lord, that we would not allow the ravens of hell to steal these words from us as we walk out into this parking lot, but Father, that we would allow these words to find good ground in our hearts, and Father, that it would bring forth fruit for your glory. For these who have bowed their knees here, my Father, I ask you that you would help them. Lord, I don't know what their prayers are. I don't know if there's a burden that they're carrying. I don't know if there's a conviction of the Spirit of God in their own personal lives. All I know is that they humbled themselves. Lord, they prayed, they called upon one that's able, and I ask you that you'd do that in their lives. Father, these who have gone to the prayer rooms, I pray that you would help. May those personal workers have wisdom in the leading of the Spirit of God and how to deal with them and how to pray with them and how to share scriptures with them. Father, I rejoice in all that I've seen and heard today, and I, I thank you. Now, Lord, I ask you that you would bless us as we go our separate ways today. And I pray that you would uh, use us somehow, some way, for your glory. And, Father, as we come back tonight, we come back rejoicing in you. And we'll be thankful for what you do. Would you bless this week, Father, yes. with your presence in every meeting? May you be honored and glorified, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.